I'm going to talk a little bit about a project we've done for the pharmaceutical industry and understand that not everyone is in the pharmaceutical industry. So I'll try to give a presentation that would be a little more conceptual so that you have some take home, maybe you get some inspiration hopefully from this presentation. So what it is about is um, I'm going to describe to you some of the motivation that led to this project and some of the objectives and then um, why we chose the agent-based model. Um, in our industry, the most popular one for product forecasting is the EPI model. So you have this cascading system. And this one's a little a departure from uh, what the industry does. And then I'll say a few words about the methodology, maybe highlight some of a few points, um, say a few words about the, the result and some of the unexpected results that we got as well from this uh, project. So in terms of uh, motivation, it is about um, forecasting the, uh, the, the sales of a product. And um, so what we wanted to do in this project is instead of looking at the macro picture, is to take a deep dive and a bit like a cottage industry, we wanted to understand the dynamics that happen in a group practice. The group practice is the smallest unit where everything happens, right? So we basically delved into the group practice and tried to understand what happens and from there try to forecast what happens at the US level, the national level. And um, some of the questions we got was to look at the uh, optimal promotion. So what happens in essence, we have the patient on the one hand and the physician on the other. And uh, the patient is exposed to what we call DTC, direct to consumer. So that would be the web, that would be TV, ad, and so on. And so the patient gets exposed to DTC and maybe would get more eager to go to the physician, right? Think of uh, Viagra as an, uh, as an example, right? And then the physician, just the same, gets exposed to uh, detailing from the, uh, from the medical reps, right? And until lately, we had about 101,000 uh, uh, medical reps in our industry. Now it's about 70,000. So the, the physician gets exposed to the rep, and the eagerness or the willingness of the, doc of the doctor to write the prescription would increase as well. So we wanted to take that into account that the coming together of the patient and the physician to produce, not a baby, but a prescription, right, that ultimately get converted into a, a, a fill at the pharmacy, right? So the question is, you have a bundle of money and you can spend a lot of money in the DTC and that would mean less money on the DTP, which is the personal selling. So the question is naturally an optimization question between how you break out the money, okay? And then there were questions like um, CSO, this is a, what a CSO is a bit like a temp, right? So you can go and grab a sales force that you hire for six months to help you launch a product. So that's kind of questions about um, the key opinion leaders. Some docs, a big docs would basically um, issue their recommendation um, supporting your drug or maybe undermining the drug. So we want to understand as well the impact of the key opinion leader on the industry, right? Um, so I, I want to go into uh, maybe why agent-based modeling. Um, as for you, I'm sure it's a slam dunk question. You don't even think about it. But for us coming more from the EPI model, we had to be motivated a little bit to choose agent-based modeling. And I'm sure, as you know, there are tons of models that you could use. And one thing that for us that was key is that in our industry, in the pharma industry, along with the uh, consumer package, we've got lots of data, right? The industry, writes uh, in the US consumes 3 billion prescriptions a year. Just think about that number, right? We're about 312 million people according to the uh, most recent data. That's a lot of prescription per person, including the baby and the old people. Uh, old people you can understand, but the baby, right? So in one of the features is that we have data. We have lots of data to be able to calibrate the model. So that for us was a very interesting feature of the problem. So one of the reasons why we went to agent-based modeling. But that, of, of course, is not the major one, right? I mean, it's important, it's not the major one. So the first one is, I think, the bane of, uh, of mankind, I would think, is our inability to see the large picture. We see the local things very well. And um, actually, I happen to have studied artificial intelligence in our prior life, and now I'm very interested in natural stupidity. And, and some of the features of natural stupidity, and you can talk to me about that after the talk during lunch, is our inability to connect things together. We see the task very, very locally. And some wise guy said, when you want to uh, solve a big problem, you chop it in small pieces. 
and you solve these small pieces. What the big guy didn't tell you too much is how to connect them together. And a lot of the problems we have is our inability to see the provable forest. We see the trees very well. So if you look at this picture here upstairs, and it, we, we don't really know what the heck this thing represents, right? So if we have the ability to take a step back, we would see Marilyn Monroe, right? So our, just the way our brain works is if we have the ability to take a step back so the pictures come crisper and we can see what's happening. So that's one of the reasons why we use agent based model. The second one is we want to be able to do a model where all the agents are not robots, replicas of each other. So through the variables, say uh, vector variables that we have, we can import different features associated to each of the agent. For instance, you can define the height following some kind of, say, Gaussian distribution. You can, for us, the propensity of the doctor to write a prescription could be distributed normally. It doesn't have to be normal. It could be anything you want, right? So the patient um, being patient or impatient, so waiting the patient and then leave the, the waiting room because tired of waiting, right? So we can have something which is much more realistic and as a, as a result, much more credible in terms of the results that we find. Other one is the, when we run the model, we have the unfolding of the model right in front of our eyes. So if something weird happens, you would see it right away. And that's to be contrasted with, say, like a black box model, right? So think of um, a neural network. So the neural network would tell you, um, here's the separation, here's this is labeled number two, segment two, segment four, and you ask, why is it segment four? Well, you have to believe it, right? Because those are the values on the synapses that connect the neurons in the system. But you open it, you would see, only see numbers. It's a bit like our brain, right? You open it, you'll see the synapses, uh, you'll see the neurons, but you don't get the level of knowledge you're interested to be able to explain what's happening. So the other feature is we wanted it to be, for us to be able to explain what's happening, right? The uh, anti-black box. And then here we're also interested in how an agent influence an agent that influences an agent, right? So you have this KOL mess that happens of the mutual influences uh, between people. So those are basically to recap, those are the major points why we went for the agent based model. Does that make sense? Very good. So I'll say a few words about the methodology. Um, so here we have basically a picture on my, uh, on my right here, um, on your left. It would be, so the patient, that is exposed to DTC and uh, doesn't feel so well, read print ads, watches TV and so on, is drawn from his or her house to go to the physician office. And in the physician office, there's the doctor, obviously, that's the reason why the patient's going there. But there's also reps calling on the doctor. And the doctors are also invited in, in our industry to meet other doctors, we call that dinner meetings, where there's mutual uh, conference like this where there's uh, interaction between the doctors. So this is where the KOL uh, effect takes place, right? And then after that, after that, they go into, you know, picking up the prescription at Walgreens that ultimately gets converted. And one of the in, uh, issues of the industry is we have something called abandonment. Abandonment is the prescription is not picked up by the, uh, because too expensive or the patient thinks it's useless, right? So there's no need to do that. So what we have is three agents. We have the patient, who's an agent, exposed to DTC. We have the physician, who's a, a, another agent, exposed to DTP, personal selling. And then you have the reps calling on, not only the rep for our client, but the competitive reps as well that's going to call on the client to push for a different drug in the same therapeutic area. And um, so those are the little picture there is the type of interaction that you have between patient, physician, between physician and rep, and between physician and physician. So what we have here, the, the model that we took is that the physician would have memory loss, right? The physician forgets. Because if the physician didn't forget, why are you sending the rep one more time to see the doctor, right? So you have a natural decay of information that you have. So we use a simple exponential uh, distribution to capture um, also some kind of law of diminishing returns that if I keep on calling you two times, three times, we don't have two or three times more propensity to write. So naturally, there's some kind of asymptotic behavior. And this sounded like a natural pick. I mean, I'm sure if you want to pick up a fight on this, you'll have good points to say, oh, JP doesn't work like this. 
Um, and just to be symmetric, we have the same thing on the patient. So the patient gets exposed to DTC, and we have the same exponential business that happens, right? So now we have two very symmetric, uh, from a modeling standpoint, that's kind of very satisfying. We've got two uh, symmetric uh, modeling of the patient and the physician, and then we get them to come together, right? So this is what's represented here. So the, um, the uh, eagerness of the patient to get the prescription is defined by a vector of the various drugs that are in that category. So for example, you want uh, a statin, for instance, like Lipitor, Zocor, Crestor, and so on, right? And then on the same side, on the other side, you get the physician that has the propensity to write those drugs. And what we did, we have two vectors, so each vector represents the different drugs, and we married the two vectors. And the, the way we did that is we said that, you know, I'm going to respect your opinion, so for each one, we take the minimum of the two values of the corresponding position in the vector. So if you're not big on writing this prescription, and I want this, this drug very much, you're going to win, right? Because you're the doctor, you hold the pen, right? So somehow we need to do a min uh, combination of the two vectors. So we take the min of the two. And also when we talk, I can tell you how much I want this drug. So I want to basically, there's something we call the emotional tuning that happens. So I'm going to influence you in the way you were looking at the problem before I spoke with you. So somehow we have an average of the, of the, of the vectors, right? So we took what I call the av min av, which is the average of the minimum and the average, right? So that's the, the, uh, the function that we use. And uh, so that's a little example to tell you we have the vector of the propensity or the eagerness to get the drug. And then we go through some normalization business. We take the cumulative business and boom, we get a random number from zero and one and puff. This is the drug that the doctor is going to uh, prescribe to the uh, patient. That makes sense? And just to make it a little more complicated, um, if the eagerness is, too, is not too high on the side of the patient, the physician can open the drawer and give a sample, right? So in which case, the patient's going to try it, not very convinced, nothing to pay, maybe I'll give it a shot, right? So in terms of the dispensing, dispensing is not the right term, but the dispensing, it would be either nothing, a sample, or a paid prescription. So, um, so here's my little chart that shows on the horizontal axis the, uh, the eagerness of the physician to write the prescription. And you can see it's chopped here. I have not four quadrants, but six boxes. So in the middle, that represents the sample. So if the patient is not so big on it, then it would go in the middle one where the doctor would give the sample, right? So you can see if the doctor and the patient are big, it would be the one on the top, the green one. So in which case, the interaction the visit would result into a prescription. If it is, both are not big on it, so the drug is not going to happen. And that inspired us to do some kind of um, a feedback loop on the optimization, meaning that many times when the drug is not written, it's not because it's, it's not in the top quadrant, uh, the, uh, the six guys, or I call it a quadrant, right? So it's because, for instance, the doctor is very motivated, but the patient is not, or vice versa. So what that means, back to the first question I was talking about, about DTC and TPP, maybe we as a company were spending too much money on DTC that we could have moved to the DTP, and that point would move, right? So instead of getting those guys over there, we, we basically push the point over, and maybe they'll hit the green, the green box, right? So we call this the analysis of misses. By looking at the number of times that you miss and the location in that graph, it gives you a good feedback as to how we can re-change the course of the way we're spending the money. That makes sense? Okay, and uh, so a little more details, I'll skip this, and that basically tells you how the conversion between a prescription to the actual delivery of the drug. And um, just to be symmetric, one of the things that happen is me as a patient, I have to be motivated um, to pick up the drug at the pharmacy because they're going to swipe my PBM card and say, JP, the copay is $50. Really want to, oh, I have a discount code, right? So discount code, I can apply a zero copay, or I get $20 copay, or maybe I have no discount code. So depending on the availability of the discount code, it may change my propensity, my proclivity, to get the prescription or not, right? So this is, again, captured through exponential distribution. So we got a couple of things there, and then we did some uh, simple algebra. I'll skip that part. And uh, so basically, to recap in terms of the model, we. We have physician, 
we have the patient, the rep, we have this propensity. We had this business between the DTC and the DTP the coming together, the admin av vector, and we could look at the influence and all that good stuff. And uh, in terms of the results, we uh, generated the forecast um, of the product, and um, the, the product was launched around January of this year, and um, we managed to uh, express the optimal split between DTC and TTP and give recommendation in terms of the, uh, of, uh, of the span for the sampling and that stuff of the box I was explaining. And uh, we looked at different scenarios. I would take two minutes to explain something to you that we didn't, we didn't think of and we were not looking for in this model. And I think those guys would be very happy to hear this. So what, uh, what we realize is the behavior of a group practice made up of physician is not the sum of the behaviors of the physicians that make up the group practice. Meaning that we have some kind of mutual influence between the physicians that take place. It's when you look at a, a, a gaggle of pigeons flying, right? So the pigeons, they would do ballet. They would move around because each pigeon would basically get their position relative to the guy on the left, on the right, top, and bottom, right? So each one would give a cue to the other one. This is why they move so, so very nicely and graciously. So if you look at the group practice, the physicians, through the interactions of the patients, which loop back with the physicians and through the KOL, mutually influence themselves. So basically the group practice now is no longer to be seen as a bunch of wild cats, but basically a group, a coherent group that moves along. Right? So I think that's a very important, and the, 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 uh, the term for that is called emergent behavior. Right? So you're probably familiar with uh, emergent behavior. If you take a neuron in your brain, a neuron's pretty simple, right? But it's got some synapses, and then depending on the magnitude of the signal, it decides to send the signal down the line, right, on the axis. And uh, so the neuron, with all due respect, is, is not very complicated, right? But if you put 100 billion of them together, you have uh, meaning in life, you have philosophy, you have pain, you have all those concepts that emerge from a bunch of neurons that apparently don't have any of this, right? And if you take seven billion of those people, brains that you put together, you have capital punishment, you have all kinds of stuff that comes up. So the, the point is about putting the same thing together, and, or the atomic bomb, right? Putting a lot of same things together gives you emergence of behaviors that were not there in the atoms that make up the stuff, right? So a little cartoon, I'll, I'll leave you with that idea, is about how the ants do foraging, right? So when the ants move along and they have, they come up at a, a split that they don't know if you should turn right, left, or go straight, the fer what, what the ant does, it follows a very simple algorithm. It would look for the density, linear density of pheromone on the path. So when the, when the ant walks, it drops the pheromone on its path, right? So if you've got a long path and a short path, in the short path, you'll get maybe three ants that would have gone, got the food, and come back. So you can see that the density of the pheromone on the short path would be way higher than the density on the long path because few ants have covered that path yet. So at that point, the ant that comes at that point would say, oh, this is the high density. Right? And this is the low density. And very quickly, no ants will follow the long path. This is how the ants um, optimize the foraging problem. Right? So now, with all the respect for the doctors, we can look at the doctors and ant. Right? So the, when the ant makes a decision which path to go, it's going to impact not only the ant, but all the ants behind the ant. Right? Because once they decide to take a path, this one would have more pheromone. So if we go back to our business of the group practice, once a doctor starts writing some prescriptions, then there would be that effect, that group effect, right? So the, the doctor, it's a bit like catastrophe theory or chaos, whatever your training is, but you can steer with little changes in the problem, a macroscopic behavior of the group would, uh, would follow. So um, with that, I'll take your questions. <laughs>